unmute helps. So another hour of geekish technical director stuff. Uh, really looking forward to these four contributions of graduation projects. We'll start with the Scarif open source pipeline project and um, then it will be followed by the uh, challenges of Mind Palace, a virtual reality experience. Uh, the third project is going to be Quill VR in production for the project Fussel, and um, there's a lot of challenges in bringing data into Houdini back and forth. And finally, Jurai will tell us about the VFX Fractal Toolkit. So uh, that is going to be another packed hour of, of uh, slides. I don't know how many, do, have you counted them? Probably also about 100. So let's get started. <laughs> okay. Um, hi, thanks for joining our TD special talk today. Um, I'm Lukas Kotkowski. I'm Tim, hi. <laughs> and um, we both just finished our technical director um, study here um, at Film Academy in Ludwigsburg. And during our studies, we together developed um, a pipeline tool set called Scarif, uh, which we want to present to you today. Um, I'm going to introduce you to the core concepts of the pipeline, um, some of the features, and give a brief overview of the code architecture. Later on, um, Tim will continue and cover the current state of development and show you some of the tools we have. Uh, so, before we started developing Scarif, uh, we asked us a very simple question, like how can many people from different departments with diverse requirements, a variety of tool sets, unique workflows and structures, contribute efficiently and sustainably over a long time to multiple projects? So uh, it turned out that this is not such an easy question we thought in the beginning, um, but we tackled it bit by bit, and the result were the Scarif pipeline tools we are showing you today. Um, yeah, the main purpose of Scarif is classical asset management, uh, where asset means any sort of digital content you can imagine, and um, we support the most favorite tools of ours, like Maya, Houdini, Nuke, and Unity. Um, Scarif itself is a cross-platform solution, and some of the core features are scene assembly, um, asset dependency tracking. We also support decentralized asset storage, so you can store your assets on different locations, different servers. Um, we also have a unified DCC Python API, um, which enables us to write reusable code. The backbone of all of it is a MySQL database, and we also support um, synchronization to external production tools like f for example, so the producers can use the web UI to create all the different tasks. Right now, um, Scarf is deployed in two production at Film Academy, which have together about 130 shots and over 100 of assets. When, when it comes to projects of this size, it's almost impossible to, to get them with, done without any sort of automation and good workflows. So speaking of which, um, the workflows in, in Scarif, um, we have e assets and all those assets are composed of different tasks. For example, you can have a character which is composed of a model, a shading, a rig, and maybe a simulation rig if it's a complex character. And all these tasks get their work files and the work files output some published data. This publishing process is um, automated and it has customizable configurations for validations which are built into the pipeline. Only this published data then is passed to the next department. For example, the rig then, the published version of the rig goes to the animation. Um, this publish itself contains an asset node which has an ID so it's trackable over the whole pipeline for us and makes it also possible to reassemble an asset once it reaches a different department. Um, this whole workflow is completely naming convention independent and file names are generated automatically by some customizable templates. So let's talk a bit about our code architecture. Um, Scarf itself is designed in a modular way and um, initially deployed it consists of four different modules which are the hub, the apps, core and database. All these modules are distributed via PyPy server, and on top of this, that comes our own extension framework. Um, this allows to have different models additionally inst installed inside Scarif. 
for example, Maya, Houdini, and so on, these DCCs, they are just some extension modules. These extension modules are also just simple Python packages. And this makes it very easy for developers to create their own extension. So they can create their own extension for a new DCC. Um, they could create an extension to improve some of the core features. For example, they can create new files or node types. Um, yeah. Um, as the hub and all the projects live in their own Python virtual environment, it makes it possible to run each project and the hub in different configurations, different versions for each module. Um, this is also true per user because Scarif is installed for each machine separately. So user A or project A could have different versions and modules than project B. Um, when it comes to interactions with DCCs, um, Scarif and, or between DCCs and, and Scarif, um, like Maya and Houdini, the interaction happens on abstract base classes um, for most common operations. For example, scene loading is one command or node transformations. And um, this enables that we can all just write the code once with a single command and have reusable code for different DCCs. For example, Maya or Houdini, we just to use scene load as the command. And the implementations of it are loaded dynamically based on the, based on the host environment. And right now we provide a very good implementation for Maya and work in progress versions for Houdini and Nuke. So that's been Scarif in a nutshell from the concept side and now Tim will continue with the state of development. Thank you, Lucas. So let's dive right in and what we actually have uh, right now. Okay, it's not working. <laughs> All right. So. Um, when you begin with Scarif, the first thing you obviously have to do is set it up. So to differentiate ourselves a bit from other open source solutions, we tried to make it really simple to set up. Uh, speaking, uh, we have a lot of UIs for everything, starting even with the database setup. And then going into configuration, we have uh, UIs for stuff like user management and groups. Also the asset location. So Lucas mentioned that different users can have uh, different asset locations depending on their needs. Maybe the drive is mapped differently, for example. Um, also, um, we have different app environments. So, for example, the rigging TD might need some extra plugin to load in their Maya setup. So, you can define it right here. You have an interface for defining uh, environment variables and um, also um, other aspects of the application. Then we have our package manager, which is basically um, what you use to uh, manage your extensions, which Lucas mentioned. So everything is an extension you can install and uh, choose at your own um, liking. Um, the very core of Scarif is our hub. The hub is, so to say, the central entry point to everything Scarif. So from there, you can launch all these manager applications I just showed you. And you can also launch your different uh, configurations of DCCs, such as Maya and Nuke. And you can also get your latest Scarif updates right there. Going on, um, we have one main widget um, that is kind of our universal tool. Uh, that is the project browser, as we call it, and it has uh, different views for different purposes. Here you can see the tree view, which uh, basically gives you a hierarchy view of your project, and you can create and manage categories, assets, shots, tasks, variations. You can also apply metadata to your, um, for example, assets, such as the start and end date, um, a state, a priority, these kind of things. Um, yeah. And uh, another thing um, we are still working on, but uh, that is basically there, you can also analyze your dependencies so you can see what kind of model is in your rig. And um, yeah, for example. Uh, going on, uh, one use of the project manager is the content manager. That's uh, our tool in Maya used for scene assembly. It can do all the uh, stuff you would expect it to do. Um, very basic scene assembly. You can up and downgrade versions, and you can even switch node types. So, for example, if you have an Alembic cache as a traditional Maya reference, you can just switch it out to a GPU cache for better performance by just uh, toggling a box without doing anything manually. 
Going further, um, for publishing, so the distribution of finished assets to other departments, we are using the PyBlish framework, which is also open source, and it uh, gives you a good uh, basis for implementing your own tiny actions, which uh, will run uh, in sequence to form a big uh, customizable um, publish um, um, progress, so to say, and um, it's easily extendable, and we also implemented some custom filter and order functionality that is not there in the open source version yet. <laughs> um, then moving on, uh, we have the Scarif Sync. Scarif Sync is uh, our synchronization tool for Scarif, uh, our own database with external databases such as Ftrack, which is the integration we currently have and used on uh, Fuzzle and Evangeline. And it gives you the option to schedule your sync uh, at uh, the time you want it to happen and also blacklist certain tasks and assets from being synced either from or to Scarif. And also, uh, lastly, I wanted to touch upon uh, one recent addition is the Scarif engine. This is our uh, approach of how to do asset management in game engines, which is a bit harder than you might expect because they are uh, quite different uh, in terms of their actual file management. So what we are doing is we translate the structure we have in Scarif and copy over things in a certain uh, naming convention and uh, adapt them essentially to work in Unity without you being constantly having to uh, reiterate uh, on things to work. Um, and yeah, um, it's currently supporting Unity with Unreal as an option uh, for the future. Speaking of the future, a couple more ideas. So we want to improve on our uh, Houdini and Nuke support um, and also look into another uh, and a couple of new topics such as a review pipeline based on RV, which also supports Python, and uh, an editorial pipeline based on Open Timeline IO, um, which we already looked into, Unreal integration I already mentioned, and also adopt more industry standards such as USD and Material X. Now they are becoming more um, of a hot topic, and obviously everyone has to think about it, Python free. Which brings us to our announcement here, um, that we will release our efforts as an open source um, project. It's planned for late June 2019. We need to do a bit more cleanup and documentation, so you guys will have fun with it, and it will be released on LGPL version three. So keep in mind that link up there. Um, so what do you need to get started with Scarif? We are still based on Python 2.7, and basically that's all you need except for a MySQL database running somewhere. Um, we will have an online documentation, and if you want to contribute to Scarif, you can easily do that by reading the developer guide and send us a pull request, hopefully. So yeah, thank you for your attention, and uh, enjoy the rest of FMX, and stay here for the rest of this talk. <laughs> Hi, this is Nico, I'm Karl, and together with Dominic, who sits over there, we created Mind Palace. Um, and uh, we will talk now a bit about the technical challenges in the, our VR experience, Mind Palace. Um, Mind Palace is our graduation project from Film Academy. It is a real-time, six degrees of freedom, seated VR experience, and you can watch it here at FMX the whole time. So, yeah, that's the main picture. Uh, Mind Palace is a story about a broken relationship where the protagonist traps his boyfriend inside his own mind to show him his side of the relationship. In the beginning, we witness a fight in a dark but more naturalistic looking environment, and then we follow the protagonist inside his own mind, which has a completely different style and rule set. Nico will now talk about this more realistic part and how we brought the characters to life. Yeah, I'm gonna talk a little bit about our character workflow. So basically, how we get those nice actors to where they are in the engine. Um, <clears throat> so one of the first things we did was uh, that we took um, uh, some photogrammetry um, scans from our actors, and one of the reasons why I did it quite early is that it's 
it's quite complicated to uh, stage and develop a story in VR because you need some kind of reference looking through the goggles to be able to um, to to to, um, to see what's what's gonna be um, the final product. Um, so next to the scans that we uh, needed to have for plant shapes and our models, we also did a lot of other scans, especially from facial expressions, just to have some kind of reference material, some kind of clay that we can put into the engine and um, try some stuff out. And we made quite a lot of them, like um, in total 180, uh, close to 180, uh, um, 150 uh, facial scans alone, and um, to to uh, manage all of this data, um, so we batch solved them all, we used the cameras to, um, uh, we triangulated the cameras to um, get them all in the same position and scaling. And um, with the photos, we set up a couple of bed scripts just to um, be able to easily locate the, f uh, the right expression that you want to have from the right camera angle and um, that will bring you to the mesh, so you can um, you always have the mesh that you need at hand without going through the tedious process of organizing everything by hand. It was also quite useful for the blend shape process later as well. Um, and here are also uh, the final character models that were created using those photo scans. Later we had our motion capture shoot when we uh, knew a little bit more. Uh, how the story is going to be on, uh, unfolding. Um, it was a bit, uh, it, we knew that it was quite an ambitious shoot just uh, because we had quite uh, big scenes, quite long scenes that cover a lot of space, but also a lot of interaction between the characters, a lot of um, markers that were obstructed, and we also wanted to do some facial capturing. So um, we we, we did a lot of test shootings and also just test playings with the actors until we found out um, how to uh, individually um, set up our mocap system for each scene. Uh, to, uh, so when we uh, were on the shoot that we were able to act decisively and um, were able to um, recreate the volumes, have the custom marker sets already by hand and uh, focus me on the acting. So for example, the flat, we uh, split up in those four parts and for pretty much uh, all of the um, scenes in the Mind Palace, we also needed to have um, a different volume just uh, to, to capture everything that we need and without having the problems of them uh, interacting too much and uh, obstructing the markers. For facial capturing, we pre uh, pretty much had to redo every take just because when they are so close together the camera is just gonna be in the way. So we had usually one take just for the um, motion capturing and one for the facial capturing and then we tried to adjust them. And um, you can see some impressions from the, from the capture shoot and um, also how it's gonna, uh, how it ended up in the engine. Later it came to rigging, and um, for us quite challenging for rigging was that we, it was the first time that we worked with real time, we had to um, accustom ourselves a lot with um, a, lim a more limited tool set and um, not having the, the, the luxury of, the, of all those uh, nice deformers that you have in in, um, in Maya. We tried in the beginning some different techniques to get it into side the engine, but in the end we, um, we uh, just uh, constrained ourselves to joints and blend shapes. And what we did is that um, also for, for the body rig that you saw and for the face and for, for the prop rigs that we, we used some uh, deformers and stuff just to um, to have some, some, some proxy version and then recreate uh, the same effects just using those tools, sometimes procedurally uh, during the export or um, by, by hand on the, on the rig. So for the properties, even if this is not that prominent in the final piece. Yeah. And um, <coughs> one thing that uh, was a bit of a challenge, especially when more animators came in that uh, we had some troubles organizing all of those files, um, going 
in and out of uh, Unreal, back to Maya, from uh, Maya to Houdini, from Houdini to Unreal. And so um, you set up this little pipeline tool that took care about um, the rigs, the camera files, and um, all the naming and um, exporting, ar archiving the old files, etc. And um, and uh, especially like uh, for most characters, we had to uh, get out as alembics to get into Houdini uh, for the simulation part. But we also had them uh, uh, be given out for Unreal just to check if the animation is right and um, just to have everything clean and easy. And I mean, one thing that is quite nice with that, because then when, when you export it with, this, uh, with a script, you can also um, have more control of the export. So we decided to just completely rebuild all um, the whole rig during the export. Um, that gave more freedom for the, um, during the rigging process in general, because you didn't have to uh, think too much about that and just um, procedurally um, exchanging all of the things, creating the hierarchies, creating the blend shapes new, and uh, also some of the deformers um, just uh, to convert them to blend shapes and um, and joint based systems. Yeah, and this is how the animation ended up looking inside the engine. And Carl is going to talk a little bit about the GUI part. So thanks, Tom, Nico. Now we enter the, the mind, the mind palace, which is a world of memories and emotions. And we wanted to let the viewer experience like a stream of consciousness and in the same time tell more about the relationship of the couple. We imagined the mind like a flowing liquid that builds scenes and morphs scenes into each other freely. So I started doing fluid tests in Houdini. I wanted to let the fluid behave freely without gravity or something. It's like, a, like in a void, but still flows into shapes like characters or architecture. So with the help of custom vector fields, suction forces and stuff, the Mind Palace is now one big five minute long fluid stream, which consists of a shit ton of different fluid simulations merged together as VDBs with character animations and in the end got exported to Unreal Engine. And depending on the scene, the fluid emphasized the movement of the characters and it shows lust and excitement, but also in the end it destroys the scenes and the characters. To get the simulations into the Unreal Engine, um, we use a technique called vertex animation, which where the position of every vertex is stored in a texture map per frame, which we stream um, as an image sequence into the shader of Unreal. And the shader then rebuilds the original animation. And we additionally streamed also normal maps and color information to the shader. So how does it look like? It looks like this. This is uh, the scene, the, the beginning scene of the Mind Palace. On the left side, you see the different stages of the simulation. Um, and on the right side, you see the in-game look like a screen capture. And you see here that different mesh densities and moving light sources helped us in the end um, to guide the viewer's uh, attention to the, the viewer's focus. So to talk a bit about the shader development, um, uh, want to get more, I wanted to get more um, detail into the mesh because it was, um, when I exported it, pretty, it has to be uh, low poly and I wanted more detail into it so I, uh, I also wanted to, to break up the, the silhouette and I experimented with layering different copies of the same geometry over each other and by displacing them in the normal direction and masking certain parts of the copies and put a uh, a very refractive layer on top, like a like a glass material, which distorts everything that's underneath. Um, it got a sort of painterly style in the end, which was also not too heavy on the to 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 render in shader. So that's another breakdown of uh, of the kiss of the two guys. Um, you see here that the shader adds more complexity to the scene. The scene is harder to, to read because of those broken up silhouettes and broken up meshes. Um, and the idea was to let the viewer only understand a scene for a short time. And then it morphs into something else. So like, like a thought process. You only see it clearly for once and then you 
that your thought is already moving to something different. And another breakdown of a scene which comes more near the end of the experience where the fluid behaves more aggressive. It destroys the character and also the noise of the geometry is, is, is stronger and it underlines the brutality of the scene. So yeah, now I want to show um, a teaser of, the, of Mind Palace to get you into the mood to watch it later for yourself. Wake up now, my love. If only for this one time, please. Wake up. You can see, like I said before, Mind Palace in the entrance hall of, at the Film Academy booth. Thanks for your attention. Hey everyone, um, we are Team Fussel. Uh, next to me is Tim Lehr, he's the lead technical director, and I'm Alex Berwick, the director. We're gonna talk a little bit about Fussel and how we used Quill We Are uh, as a production tool and how we integrated it in our pipeline. So, what is Fussel? Fussel is our diploma project, it's a 3D animated short. It's uh, five minutes long, and we used Quill as the main asset creation tool, so all the backgrounds and most of the characters are created in Quill. What's the story about? It's about Fuzzle, a friendly blue monster who is going on an adventurous journey to find out what is at the end of the string. We brought you a little sneak peek so you can see what we're talking about. Let's start first, what is Quill? Quill is a virtual reality painting and animation software on the Oculus Rift. And you can paint strokes in front of you in 3D space. So how does that look like? Um, that's a short demonstration. On the left you can see me working with the goggles on and on the right you can see what I'm painting and what I'm seeing. So basically, I paint a flower in this demonstration and you can use it like you would use, for example, Photoshop. You choose your color, you choose your brush stroke, and then you paint, except everything you do is in 3D. So why would we use Quill for this production? So when we first started out, uh, it was important for us that we um, do something stylized and we wanted to bridge the gap between 2D illustration and 3D animation and bring that together. So we were thinking about how we could achieve that and then we, we got the idea, so if we wanna, want to have a look that looks 2D painted, why don't, but is 3D, why don't we paint in 3D? And so we came across Quill and did some tests and we liked it and so we tried if we could use it for production. What we later realized with choosing Quill is that we can be really efficient with it. Um, so our characters are going through all these different environments, which are 15 different environments, and we have a very small team. 
And basically, I painted all the environments in Quill, so we had to be as efficient as possible and also try to implement Quill into our pipeline so we don't have to do additional tasks that would um, cost us a lot of time. Also, we could do smaller animations in Quill for the backgrounds, for example, if we would add a little bit of wind or do some glow worms or some waterfalls, we could all do that right in Quill and then use that later. Uh, choosing Quill was a really good decision uh, in terms of style and also in terms of efficiency inside of the production. Um, the Quill team also helped us a lot. We bugged them with a lot of requests and uh, they were very helpful. Thank you for that. But uh, because of the short amount of production, we had some limitations with Quill. Um, we had to find our own solutions or do some workarounds. So for example, um, the first problem is um, it's a 3D animated short and you want to have full control over camera and the framing, um, but we couldn't import camera or animation inside of Quill, so we had to do a little bit of a workaround work with layouting 3D geometry traditionally in Maya, setting the camera and then bringing that geometry as a reference into Quill so we could um, paint it and make it uh, like we want it to look like. As well, we have a lot of environments um, and with a lot of trees and flowers and you name it. So we had a very heavy load of geometry and we wanted to keep the scenes light. So we wanted to have instancing. And also, for example, if you want to animate a tree, we didn't want to animate all the trees, but we wanted to animate um, one tree and put that animation on all the already placed trees. So that gave us also a lot of flexibility, um, which we had to implement on our own. And also animation blending um, isn't inside of Quill. So for example, you wanna um, animate a little bit of wind on a flower. And then so basically what you do in Quill is you take the flower and then you do something like this but you need to match the first frame and the last frame to get a smooth loop, and it's very hard to do, and I was sitting there and trying to match it perfectly so it wouldn't jump, um, but then we found another solution to um, implement that in our pipeline. So Tim will talk a little bit more of the uh, implementation in our pipeline and how we fix these problems. Thanks, Alex. So let's see what we came up with. So our solution to some of the uh, challenges we faced were our uh, own little tool set. We call it Pork. Um, basically what it is, it is a Quill exporter and a processing tool. And it has a very simple interface connected to Scarif, which we just presented, the pipeline tool set. So on the left, you see all your Scarif tasks related to Quill. And on the right, you have your uh, settings for that specific asset or shot. And uh, to do all the geometry processing, it runs Houdini in the background. Uh, here it was co-developed with our Houdini wizard, Uri, who is going to present next. And um, to keep the workflow as uh, free and um, uh, to uh, get all the advantages of Quill, uh, for Alex, we tried to apply as few constraints as possible on him. And um, so basically what are the key features here is obviously the exporting uh, of the Quill animation or Quill scene to Alembic. So that is done by uh, using the um, command line application the Quill team provides um, and then do some geometry cleanup, for example, flipping normals and more of the advanced stuff such as uh, geometry instancing, animation blending and the smoothing of normals and colors which I will show you in a minute how that looks like. And uh, once we had that asset, uh, asset all processed, we could directly have a look at it inside USD view, which is part of the Pixar USD open source um, project, which was really nice. So we didn't have to import it into Maya first or uh, any other DCC application for preview. So, Let's give you a quick rundown on how we did things. So Alex already said we wanted to be as efficient as possible, but also keep the fun and fast workflow of Quill. So everything kind of starts in Quill here by creating the assets, do some secondary animation of the environment or maybe even a small character, um, do some set dressing there. So everything basically is dressed in Quill. 
Then it goes through Pork, um, Houdini running in the background doing the processing. So once we get everything uh, processed, we put it into Scarif, and Scarif uh, is basically then the um, link to Maya, which is uh, what we use for lighting. So we had simple lighting on it for rim lights and these kind of things. And we rendered everything with Arnold uh, and a commercial tool called Multiverse uh, at 4K and 48 FPS. So with Multiverse, we could kind of keep the scenes very light and flexible and uh, make things uh, really robust, even if there was a lot of geometry. And then at the end, uh, we went through traditional compositing methods for additional 2D animation and um, yeah, uh, finishing up the look. So I will give you, give you a quick rundown on how these things look like in action. So here you can see Alex uh, um, scattering some clouds, um, doing the set dressing in Quill. So this is what you see through the goggles. And basically once he's uh, satisfied with the scene, he can have a final look at it, and then we go into Pork. And then he just picks his task, um, sets up the exporter, what he wants to export. Once that is done, takes a few moments. Uh, he can go through the settings, set up some layer settings, for example, um, this moving, add a comment, and then run the processing. And then he can hit the button and view the uh, final asset in USD view. Um, if everything is all right, we can go into Maya and use Scarif to import uh, the asset right away um, using Multiverse. So there it is uh, as a compound geometry, just one node, very light. So yeah, that's basically what it looks like. Um, so what does Pork do? Um, so some of the solutions we came up with, for example, on the left, you can see some of the colors that are basically uh, a little bit pixelated um, because all of these strokes, so these individual rows are basically individual strokes. Um, so all of the ground planes, for example, are thousands of strokes, just repeated and then painted in Quill. So we applied some smoothing on it and the same goes for the, ex uh, for example, for Fuzzle's fur, which is being smoothed. So the rim light in um, lighting is really nice and smooth as well. Uh, when we do it in compositing. Um, then comes the animation smoothing, which Alex already touched upon. So on the left, you can see it's a bit jumpy. So this whole character was modeled and animated in Quill. It's a background character and it was really uh, fast to do, but you can see it jumps a bit. So the solution we came up with basically allowed us to make everything really smooth, uh, as you can see on the right for the final movie. Also for geometry instancing, so on the left you can see we basically animated just one of each plant and the other ones are scattered uh, statically or set dressed in Quill. So this is basically on the left what comes out of Quill. And then after processing, we scattered this animation across all the static ones um, with instancing and apply some offsetting so it looks like all the um, grass, uh, for example, is moving um, uh, with a little offset and doesn't look very uniform. So that's basically it. And yeah, if you want to say something. Yeah, so if you sparked your interest in the project on and on working in Quill, um, there are ways you can get in touch with us. Um, one is we have a Quill live demo here at the FMX at the IP space area. It's if you come in the entrance, stairs up and on the left there will be on Wednesday on 11.30 a.m. Thursday on 3.30 p.m. and you can also get in touch with us via email and if you want to follow our film and see some making off and behind the scenes stuff you can visit the Facebook page. Thank you. So, hello, thank you for coming. I am Yurai Tomori and in this presentation I will cover a project I did during my studies, VFX Fractal Toolkit. 
Um, bit about me, I, I like to work on projects relate to, related to VFX, pipelines and computer graphics and I just uh, f uh, graduated from Film Academy and VFX Fractal Toolkit or VFT was my graduation project. I presented it in the TD talk here last year when it was in its early stage and now I will present how it progressed since then. My goal in this project was to explore fractal and procedural art and to implement it in VFX packages. And I created a couple of visuals with it and now I will play the first part. So, what, uh, what is this project about? Its aim was to develop a toolset for generating fractal art. Currently, there are a couple of applications for generating fractal art, but they are not VFX friendly. They can generate very nice artwork, but it is tricky to get the results into VFX pipelines. On the other hand, we have VFX applications which are very good for animating, rendering and compositing, but they like pre-made tools for generating fractal art. So I realized I could generate fractals directly in VFX applications so that no hex would be needed for post-processing or rendering them. On top of it, I would gain benefits of working in VFX applications. For example, having access to animation tools, different renderers, geometry processing, and so on. I will try to put my tool in context. Fractal art is no longer a hobby of only a small group of nerdy mathematicians. It is being used in VFX more and more and studios have already implemented their in-house tool sets for handling it. So I wanted to do my own implementation where I could explore various techniques and it would be used, uh, it, it could be used by others directly or as a reference. And this topic pretty much covers the areas I'm interested in and wanted to play with. And below you can see main sources and the references which I used. There are many techniques for generating fractals and I've played with a couple of them. For example, rematching uh, implicit surfaces, dynamical systems and subdivision surfaces. The main part of the toolset is implemented in Houdini where I used mainly OpenCL kernels for GPU accelerated calculations. Apart from Houdini, I also created tools for Arnold renderer in OpenShading language and for Nuke compositing package in Blink script. And I used Python to glue things together. Those tools are commonly used in VFX and gave me good performance. Implementations of fractals in various VFX packages share the same idea. Basically, we are iteratively applying a formula to a set of points in a domain. The domain can be a complex image plane like in Nuke implementation or a grid of voxels like in the case of Houdini or Arnold. While we are applying the same formula iteratively, we are checking if the tested point remains bounded within a certain distance or diverges, shoots off to the infinity. The cool part in, is the border between the contained and escaped points. It inherits fractal features, for example, infinite l level of detail and self-similarity at different scales. Shape of the fractal is determined by used formula and values of its parameters. Fractal shapes are interesting because of their complexity. However, uh, all of this detail needs to be computed and stored somewhere, which takes time and space. We cannot just compute fractals every everywhere. We need to do it cleverly to compute only what is visible. For example, camera's point of view. Unfortunately, we cannot ray trace fractals directly because we don't know the exact intersections, but we can ray match them. We send a ray and test it along its way if it belongs to the fractal or not. This process can be optimized by taking less steps. 
we can do so by leveraging uh, distance estimate, which can be derived from some fractal functions. In this video, you can see sped up a screencast of working of me working in the Houdin integration. I implemented various fractal functions as different nodes. They result in different shapes of fractals. The nodes have a number of parameters which further modify their look. Fractal functions can be chained together to create new forms, and there are also nodes which modify coordinate space, for example, by adding repetition, noise distortion, or mi mirroring. I am generating additional information which can be used for colors in shading or as emission, as you saw in the intro video. For optimization purposes, the fractal is generated from camera's point of view in frustum or volume that is visible from the camera. This gives adaptive level of detail and uh, computing power is spent only on areas which are directly visible to the camera. This allows for zoom-ins with the same computing time. It holds up until a certain threshold where we hit numerical precision issues. And there are multiple calculation modes implemented, which I will describe in the next slide. Based on the desired look and of the fractal and short requirements, there are multiple generation modes to choose from. Currently, there are five of them, each with, each with its own advantages and disadvantages in terms of how much information is computed and how is it stored in relation to the viewer. Another part of the VFT are strange attractors. The idea behind them is similar to fractals. We are following path of the tested point this can look random, but after many iterations, the trajectories can produce patterns. Strange attractors are usually portrayed statically, but they can as well produce interesting animations, which are explored in the following animation. Another approach I took was with subdivision surfaces. For that, I implemented Cutmore-Clark subdivision scheme in VEX, but with an option to modify the smoothing weights. The original in originally intended weights result in a smooth limit surface, which is usually the goal. But by modifying those weights, interesting structures can appear. During the project, I quickly realized that some of the techniques are suitable for real-time rendering. In the previous techniques, I focused mostly on offline approach, but I also did a couple of tests in real time. The first one is rendering in a web browser. It is rendered on the GPU thanks to WebGL. It is experimental and currently cannot do much, but I wanted to give it a try to see how it would perform. And I also experimented with AR. This is a marker-based test running in a web browser on an Android phone. Because it is web-based, there are no dependencies required, like plugins or apps. It's experimental, and the performance is not good enough yet, especially on the older devices, but I find it quite interesting. So this is end of my presentation. Thank you for coming and for your attention. Ooh. So would it make sense for all the presenters to go up front maybe and answer questions if there are, are any in the audience? So any, any questions about the projects that we've just seen? No? <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
<laughs> so you could have stayed where you were. No. Um, okay, so I'm going to ask a question. Joy, what's happening with the um, Fractal Toolkit now? So um, I will release it in the next days or weeks. It's now in, it would need a bit of cleanup and like some corrections, but I think I will release it to the public so people can play around with it and yeah, have fun with it and explore, extend, fix problems and yeah. Okay. Any questions? No? All right, here's one. Yeah, hello. It's a question to any of you who wishes to comment on that, that these very nice examples come all from men with technical background. So what is the typical trajectory that you study computer graphics in a, some in a technical school? And then what makes you to come to the RT world? And what is your perspective? So do you get good jobs? Is it more rewarding, um, professionally, creative, financially? Uh, so this is kind of a personal answer, I guess, because I cannot speak for all of us, but for me, uh, I come from a computer science background, and at some point during the studies, um, so I was always very much into animation, and I'm a, I'm a nerd, so to say, I'm a real big movie buff and all these kind of things, so it's always been in my DNA. And then I realized, oh, you can actually do it as a job, which came in quite late, but Finally, I realized this is actually a possibility that people do this for a living. And yeah, the rest is kind of history, I guess, <laughs> at this point. And yeah, maybe Lucas. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, for me, uh, actually, I do not have such a super technical background. So I studied uh, digital media in Darmstadt, Hochschule Darmstadt, and um, it was more like an all round trip there. So. Um, you could specialize yourself on art or technical stuff, and I like I try to do both, not too deep, but in a wider range. And um, after two years of working experience, I I just realized, okay, at Film Academy, I can yeah focus more on the technical side because I realized that's what I want to do. And yeah, most of us, I think, uh, what motivates is just like fun in exploring the technology. I think, <laughs> yeah, that's what I would say. Any of the others, maybe? Uh, maybe I can say something. Uh, so I study animation at the Film Academy, so I'm not a TD, um, but I have had the chance and the pleasure to work with all these guys, and I think that's the important part, is why we need the TDs, and it's that artists like me who would do stuff a thousand times again, because I'm not uh, smart enough to do the programming of it, these guys come in and uh, make everything faster and make everything better so that I can uh, bring my vision uh, out of my brain onto the screen and they guys are amazing at doing that. Yeah, I also studied animation and not technical directing but I'm I'm feeling that I'm more and more interested in the gap between art and science and like doing both. And um, like I, um, I got in contact with Houdini like two years ago and I'm now really hooked to like learn more about the computer science behind stuff to improve my artistic skills. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> I also don't. Uh, didn't study technical directing, uh, <laughs> and it, um, it's just something that uh, came up a couple of years ago to uh, get more interested in that field. And in film academy, it's very open that you can um, explore your own way and also find some stuff that you are interested in and switch a couple of times, which I think is great. And uh, so also our presentation was, I guess, a little bit less technical than the others, but um, it is just. Some is just a great thing to play around with and to dive in deeper. So also not that much of a technical background before. Yeah, f for me, I I didn't have I didn't study like computer science. I studied visual effects, 
which weren't like very technically based. But then I came here to university with the hope to focus more on technical things because that was the the most fun part from for me. And during the studies, I tried to to learn the principles and the logic behind things. Yeah, thank you. Maybe let me ask, because you you were asking about this being a boys' club, <laughs> mostly, which is true, and it's it's sad. But we have um, female technical directors. We also have animation students who who are quite technical uh, and and follow more the, of the technical path, like the example of animation students that you see up front. But it's true. Um, we we could receive more applications from women. And uh, I think I, I would like to encourage all women to apply, not to be shy. Uh, uh, um, they, they are a very important part in our teams. It's always good not to just have boys in a room and, um, you know. Uh, so, yeah, but it is mostly male at that point, yeah. And then can you also reflect? reflect on the future of this people so the, is there is there a film industry which is waiting like banks and big internationals yeah i i, I, I certainly can say that our technical director students find job very easily uh, find work everywhere uh, worldwide so yeah uh, they work in all major studios but also some take different routes. So we have one former student who works as a software engineer at Foundry. You know, he works on uh, tools like Katana. Others follow more of a research path. So a lot of them go into production for film effects and games, but also others go into more technical, more research uh, academic uh, careers. So there was one more question in the back there. Hi, so this question is for Tim and Lucas. Yeah, yeah, hi. Um, so you've described that um, you can, for every single project and um, DCC, you can describe an environment for different packages. How do you deal with package conflicts? So should I answer this one? Yeah. Um, so package conflicts are, um, a bit of a problem still, so because um, what we are doing is uh, to make things as simple as possible, but also a bit flexible, which is you have to compromise at some point. So what we have kind of is an environment of Python packages, uh, uh, for example, let's, let's keep it at Python, um, for each project. And if there are conflicts, for example, there are uh, conflicts uh, in, in Maya and Houdini in some parts, uh, we are currently kind of um, doing workarounds for this and uh, uh, because other solutions like RAS, for example, which I'm sure you're familiar with yeah. if you're speaking of it, they require more of a technical setup. You need to know what you're doing while um, we try to make kind of a compromise between one-click solution and working. Um, <laughs> to a certain degree, but yeah, at some point you will run into trouble if you have more complex setups and then you need a kind of a TD who can uh, write a Scarif package, for example, that fixes your issue um, and install it on the, uh, in the project. All right, thanks. Okay, yeah, I think we also uh, uh, run out of time for the room. There's another uh, the final question, okay. <laughs> Sorry for that. Uh, I would like to ask a question to the Quill team. Uh, oh. It's, it's. Yeah. I just, I was just wondering, uh, did you started to make the project and then think that Quill is the right tool to do that, or did you find a tool that it that looks like super cool and wanted to do a project with it? Okay, I think Alex can handle this. <laughs> um, at the beginning, there was the idea to create something stylized. And then we approached it to look at reference images and see what we liked. And we thought, how could we replicate that in 3D? Because we also wanted to, do, uh, to use um, the benefits of 3D animation and not painting everything by hand. Um, so we looked at different stuff. Um, we tried some different stuff, but everything was was okay-ish and was very, um, took a lot of work 
And then we came across Quill, and it was actually Tim who approached me and said, like, hey, you want to do a 2D painted look, but in 3D, why don't you paint it in 3D? And I was like, sure, why not? Let's try it. And then I did the first tests, and I really loved the approach of it and how it feels to paint uh, in virtual reality. And then I got back to Tim, and we discussed if it's possible to do a project and integrate Quill into the pipeline. And then that's where it all started, and uh, we got get going and try to uh, make it work. Cool. Well, thank you very much for your sort of sh for sharing your work with us in this session, and thanks for your interest. And um, yeah, uh, let's give a round of applause for the speakers.